So we are in our series, Encounters with Jesus. And today we're in part five. We're going to talk about a man who we know about, the Apostle Paul, but a little bit about his calling when he was Saul of Tarsus. We're going to kind of open it up to see a little bit of things that happened with this encounter with Jesus, but also what we can learn today from this encounter with Jesus that Saul has because there's a little bit of Saul in all of us, unfortunately. So we're going to be in the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. Acts 9, 1 through 12. Let me give a little backstory before I read this. Because what we're doing, we're kind of parachuting into this story that's already happening. There was great growth in the early church when it first began in the book of Acts. And then what happened was these Christians began, some of them began to be very bold against the Jewish leadership. And the Jewish leadership, who, as I said, who were elites, did not take kindly to that. Elites don't like being talked to. They don't like that. Whether it's in the political world, the corporate world, the religious world, wherever, they don't like being talked down to. So some of these early Christians began to challenge the Jewish leadership about how they didn't have a really vision of what God was doing on the earth. And they didn't, because they were so proud, so arrogant in their elitism, they didn't want to hear anything about Jesus. So there was a, there was a, a, a trial of a man named Stephen in Acts chapter 8. Actually, Acts chapter 7. Acts 7. And then what happened was is Stephen really told these people where the dog died. He gave them a whole list of the whole Jewish history. He was, a, he was like an encyclopedia. And they didn't like that either. So at the end, they ended up stoning Stephen. And then after that, there was a great persecution that broke out. You see this in Acts chapter 8. So Christians were running for their lives everywhere because the Jewish leadership began to go and capture people and arrest people and bring them to trial and they were afraid. And the Saul of Tarsus, who was a Pharisee, was at the, the head of this zealous movement. So there was lots of chaos in the early church as this persecution broke out. And what we're going to do right now is we're going to parachute into this story as we get into Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. You'll have to have a handout because it's not up on the screen. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest and he requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. Now, early Christ Christianity was not called Christianity, it was called the way. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on his mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who, who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Yikes. Now get up and go into the city. I, I, I like the way this reads here. Now get up and go into the city. He's being told what to do by the one he's persecuting. And you will be told what you must do. Boy, was he humbled. The men with Saul stood speechless as they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. And Saul picked himself up off the ground, and when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling, Ananias! Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man, named, for, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. 
I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. There's much more to this story, but you'll have to read that yourself. But what I want to do is really expound on this encounter that Saul had with Jesus and how there's a little bit of Saul sometimes in all of us. You know, it's difficult to overestimate the influence that the Apostle Paul had in this world. He is known worldwide as one of the greatest Christian missionaries and apostles for the last 2,000 years. His inspired letters, writings, cover half of the New Testament. Half of our New Testament was written by the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, but the Apostle Paul was the vessel to write that. The very words that we hang on in the New Testament, half of them come from the Apostle Paul. And it's safe to say that it remains one of the most read authors in human history. But his abrupt turnaround from a zealous persecutor of the early church to one of Christianity's greatest proponents surely shaped the history of the early church, but also our world. But who exactly was this Saul of Tarsus before he became the Apostle Paul? I mean, what do we know about his life before having this encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road. Well, Saul of Tarsus was born around approximately 5 AD, about a decade later after Jesus was born. Jesus was born between 4 and 6 BC. So it's about a decade later after Jesus was born. So Jesus was around 10 years old when Saul was born. But he was born in the city of Tarsus in Caesarea, which now is in modern-day Turkey. But Saul was born to Jewish parents who possessed something very special that not everybody in the Greek world had. They had Roman citizenship, which was a special privilege born to everyone who was in Tarsus, because one of the emperors there made it a special city for himself, and everyone born there could have Roman citizenship, which gave you special privileges. A lot of people had to pay for that. You had to pay dearly a lot of money to even be a Roman citizen if you weren't born in Rome. But what happened was he was born to Jewish parents who possessed Roman citizenship, and it was a coveted, coveted privilege for their son to possess. So around 10 AD, Saul's family moved to Jerusalem. And then around sometime, you know, 15 to 20 AD, Saul began his studies as a rabbi in the Hebrew scriptures in the city of Jerusalem under a rabbi teacher, a special rabbi. His name was Gamaliel. It was under Gamaliel that Saul would begin this in-depth study of the law with this famous rabbi. Who was Gamaliel? Not everybody got to, to learn under Gamaliel. Only the select choice people who showed promise, those are the ones who Gamaliel invited to come and be disciples under his teaching and ministry. It was like studying basketball under Michael Jordan. It was like studying football under Tom Brady. That's who Gamaliel was. He was in the religious world. He was much sought after, but not everybody was able to learn under him. So Saul studied under him the best. So Saul was well-educated, a well-educated man, and he was of the Pharisee wing of Judaism, which was an extremely radically strict wing of Judaism. And Saul was zealous for the Jewish law and the Jewish religious life, and he was taught that any diversion from this was a capital offense in the eyes of God. And this is why they could never understand Jesus, because Jesus defeated every argument that they ever threw at him. And their education and their wisdom was never a match for the Son of God, who is total, totally pure, un, un, unlimited knowledge. He was God in the flesh. That's why they hated him all along, and they also hated anyone who followed his teachings. It's quite possible that Saul was present at the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus as well. The Jewish religious leaders finally thought 
that we finally got rid of this rogue movement. If we can kill their leader, we can disband their movement. But we know that didn't happen. It got even stronger. And in the book of Acts, there was a trial that resulted in a Christian, as I said, named Stephen. And he was being stoned to death for really telling the religious leaders how wrong they were. And he was the first Christian martyr that we ever had. And Saul was right there, well pleased with what was going on. We see that in Acts chapter 8. And as I told you earlier, the great persecution broke out in Jerusalem with these early Christians, led by Saul of Tarsus, who obtained a letter of permission, as we read, to go to Damascus to arrest and bring back to Jerusalem anybody who was committed to following this false Messiah, Jesus, for trial under Jewish law. And Saul had murderous intents in his mind about these Christians and these heretics who left Orthodox Judaism to start this cult of the way. This is how he thought. Well, on his way to Damascus, as we just read, to extradite these Christians back to Jerusalem, Saul was confronted by the very one he was trying to destroy. That was Jesus. What followed was one of the most dramatic, dramatic conversions in church history. Saul of Tarsus became the Apostle Paul, a sold out minister, minister and a missionary and an apostle to an unbelieving Gentile world and a fine example of faithful service in the face of persecution. Saul's education, his background as a Pharisee, a Roman citizen, and his zealousness for Judaism in a zealous nature, period, all contributed to his success as an apostle and as a missionary. Because for that to happen, those credentials and those traits had to be surrendered humbly to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what he did. Then Jesus commissioned the apostle Paul to a world that he hated and he detested. And he thought he was better than that world as an elitist. That was the Greek, Roman, Gentile world. They practiced detestable things in the sight of the Lord and were sinfully unclean. He was gonna to have to depend on Jesus to truly change his heart and his attitudes towards these people because Jesus came and died for them as well not just the Jews like Saul. So over time, the Apostle Paul actually loved the people he was bringing to Christ, and you can see that in his letters. You can see when he writes to the Philippians, he writes to the Colossians, the Galatians, he writes to these churches, and he loves them. He loves them. God gave them a heart for them because he knew that Jesus died for them as well. And over time, the zealous Jew had a heart change. And what happened was, as you know, the book of Acts, every time he went into a Greek world and he began to preach the message of Jesus, it was the Jews in those towns, usually, that made an uproar, that rose up, that caused trouble, that rioted, that accused him of teaching heresies. And some of them tried, many times, a couple times, he almost died at the hands of the Jews. We just went through the book of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. This is what happened there. These were people just like he was. He understood them because I was blind just like you. But many times he had to run for his life out of these places because they were just as blind as he was. But when an individual has an encounter with Jesus, don't miss this, it's to stop them in their tracks. It's to start them the tracks on their journey that they are on to alter the direction of their life for the glory and the purposes of Jesus. This is what happened to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. That encounter with Jesus stopped Saul in his tracks on his journey. And it altered the direction of his life forever for the glory and purposes of Jesus. Did not Jesus do the same thing with Matthew, the tax collector? Did he not do the same thing with Peter, James, and John, the fishermen? Did he not do the thing with, same thing with Zacchaeus, the tax collector? Nicodemus, the Pharisee? The criminal on the cross next to Jesus as he was dying? 
The woman at the well, who was an outcast in her own society. Mary Magdalene, who had seven demons cast out of her by Jesus. The woman caught in adultery. Did not Jesus stop them in their tracks and alter the direction of their lives for his glory and his purposes? Yes, he did. That's what Jesus does. Can you remember the, your encounter with Jesus when he stopped you in your tracks and altered the direction of your life for his glory and his purposes? Maybe it's been a long time, and we have to remind ourselves sometimes and refresh our memories why we were called to begin with. It was called for his glory and his purposes. Remember our opening scripture this morning from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We don't get saved to do our own thing. We get saved to do his thing. But many Christians are busy doing their thing. And they're frustrated in their Christian walk and in their relationship with God. We were all saved for his glories and purposes as he's reshaping us into a masterpiece. His masterpiece. Walking in the works he prepared us to do. And are we doing them? That's the question. Too many Christians are sitting on the sidelines not walking out the good works God prepared for them for his glory and purposes. And their Christian walk doesn't really make sense to them because they're out, they're on the wrong trail. God's prepared us to walk here. We're still saved, but we're walking over here. And sometimes there's a disconnect between us and our Heavenly Father because we're not really synced in what he's called us to do. Sometimes God called us to do great things, big things. Sometimes God drew this, called us to do little simple things. We all have a walk and a purpose that he laid out for us. We have to be careful because every Christian will answer for their idleness if they're idle on the sidelines, not walking in the plans of God. Imagine the Apostle Paul had this encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. He lost his eyesight. Jesus saved him, sent him to Damascus to a man named Ananias to lay hands on him to regain his sight. Jesus called him for his purposes and his glory. And the Apostle Paul bought a house in Damascus and said, I like it here. I think I'll plant a garden over here. I think I'll get some chickens. I think I'll paint this room blue. That blue, that room yellow. I'll get a dog. Start a business. Nice place to settle, Damascus. I like it here. That would be a slap in the face to Jesus because that's not why he saved Saul of Tarsus. It was for his glory and his purposes, not Saul's. He had work to do. He would have stayed Saul of Tarsus forever if he had did what I just told you. And he would have fallen far short of the plans and purposes of Jesus had for him. And we wouldn't even have all these churches in Europe. We wouldn't have half the New Testament if he had done that. But why do I say that? Because many Christians, unfortunately, will not only miss out on the plans of God for their lives here on earth if they do the same thing. They will miss God and what God has for them. They will be greatly disappointed as well at the great award ceremony one day that every Christian will stand before. No one is getting out of it. Every Christian will stand before a great award ceremony. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. And we will be judged not for our sins. We will be, those are already on the cross. Praise God for that. We will be judged for our works. Every dollar we gave, every, every every, all the time we gave, every prayer we prayed, every cup of water we gave to somebody, the big things, the little things, the way we became disciples, the way we learned, the way we transformed, everything we did for the Lord, every time we spent time in the Sunday school teaching children downstairs, it doesn't matter. Everything is being recorded and it will be rewarded. And the things that are not done, that will, we will suffer loss for those things. 
So understand, we don't really see the impact of that now, but we will feel it when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It has nothing to do with our salvation. It has to do with our rewards and gifts that he will give to us for what we did for here on the earth. It's important to walk in the plan of God, believe me. But every true Christian, and I mean true, because there are many deceived people, unfortunately, that they think they are saved and they are not saved. Jesus said that, not me. He said, many people will say to me, Lord, Lord, on that day, and I will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Jesus said this in other places. There are people who think they're saved and they're really not. If you have the Holy Spirit in you, it will cause you to motivate you to do something, to become more like Christ, to pursue Christ, to really walk in the plans of Christ and to grow and transform into the image of Christ. If there's something alive in a true Christian, they just can't sit around and do nothing because they're gonna be miserable. They need spiritual food, they need to get in that Bible, they need to work for the Lord, labor for the Lord, be in fellowship with other Christians and grow a healthy disdain for that sinful world out there. It doesn't satisfy anymore. That world is a mission field still, but it doesn't satisfy anything for us. The more I live in this world and I grow in Christ, the more I hate that world system. I hate it. I hate the corruption. I hate the sin. I hate everything about it. I love the earth and God's creation, but not the corruption of the devil's world. I hate it more and more. That means something in me is transforming. That means something in you is transforming. That's a good thing. But we always have to remember that's still a mission field. It's still a mission field. Jesus came to pluck people out of that sinful existence. So what am I saying here? We need to make sure that we're walking with the Lord. But every true believer in Jesus is saved by his grace through faith. And it wasn't their own doing. It was the gift of God. And we can't earn it. There's no work we can do to earn it. Because there wouldn't be a gift. Grace is a gift. So what happens is we have work to do to walk in with Jesus. And this is what Saul of Tarsus did. And what I'm saying right now is before we leave today, I want to just give us some things to think about, about this conversion of Saul and how important it was. Because Saul made a big impact on this world because he said yes to Jesus to walk in the plans and purposes that were laid out for him. I just gave you two examples today that I want to go over that kind of we can really think about our own lives as we look at Saul. So just follow me for a minute. Number one on the back of your handouts. There's a principle here and a truth. Overzealousness can make you blind. Overzealousness can make you blind. Look at Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Paul writes to the Galatians, For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many my own age among my people who was and, and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. He was so zealous for the way of Judaism, it blinded him to what God was really doing. Let me expound on this. As I mentioned earlier, Saul of Tarsus was a Jew's Jew. He was a Jew's Jew, highly educated in the highest university system in Jerusalem. He became a rabbi. He knew the law of Moses. He knew the ways of God. He knew the history of Israel. He knew everything about it. And he was so proud of that. He's telling the Galatians here after his salvation, and he's working with the Galatian church, writing this letter, that how zealous he was for the purity of the Jewish law and how he persecuted the church for diverting away from true Judaism. This is not a true movement. We need to destroy it. His attitude was, I mean, I'm Saul. I speak for God. I know the law and the traditions of my fathers. I know what the will of God is. I know what the ways of God are. I know what the justice of God is. I know what the righteousness of God is. I was within my rights as a spiritual leader in Jerusalem to go after these heretics called Christians or the way and the ones who follow in this false Messiah, Jesus. And God's using me, because I'm special, 
to wipe these people out. So he thought. As we know from the story, as well educated in the Bible, his Bible of his day, which we know is the Old Testament, as much as he swore he knew God, as much as he thought he knew the will of God, everything about God, he knew nothing. He didn't know any of those things. Paul was, Saul, excuse me, was spiritually blind due to his hatred of people who thought differently than he did. And as he was spiritually blind because he was arrogant, and he was spiritually blind because he was zealous for God, however, he really didn't know God, love God, or love the things God loved. People needed a savior, a Messiah, and that's who Jesus was who could reconcile them back to God. But Saul was spiritually blind to that fact because his zeal for what he thought God was doing was misguided. He thought he knew the plans of God, the purposes of God, because his zeal greatly misguided him. And Jesus took him, and he ended up on the ground and temporarily took his eyesight away on that road to Damascus to show Saul a physical manifestation of his spiritual problem. You are spiritually blind, and you can't see. You cannot see. You stumble around the darkness. You think that you know everything. You think you know me. You think you know what I'm doing on this earth. You know nothing. Even though you know the Bible, you know nothing. Because you don't love people. Your love for me has waned. And you're so zealous and so blind to certain things that you don't have my heart. You don't see what I'm doing on the earth. And because Jesus didn't fit into his narrative of what he thought God was currently doing, he missed God. And that's why he was spiritually blind. All because he was overzealous for the wrong things. It caused a blindness to see what God was actually doing on the earth with Jesus until he had that encounter with Jesus, and it changed his life. As I leave this point, here is my caution to all of us, including me. Because the world is on fire right now, it's going bananas. And there is no real direction in this world by any world leader. The world is chaotic and it's primed for a slick world leader to rise up out of the rubble of chaos to solve major problems such as wars, economies, health, division, education. And the Bible has many names for this slick world leader, but the one that seems to stick the most, his name is the Antichrist. With so much deception all around us in this hour, not to mention the great amount of wickedness as well, what is God doing in the earth at the moment? What is he doing? That's a question. Many of us have opinions of what he's doing right now. I do. We as Christians have to hold our zeal for the truth of God through Jesus Christ and his ways loosely at times. It doesn't mean that you don't educate yourself, read your Bible, and develop some good, strong, clean theology. That's not what I'm saying. We need to do that. But even when we do that, we have to hold things loosely at the time because we don't know what God is exactly doing in this hour. We know the world's on fire. We know it's looking for answers. We know it's looking for a savior. That's what's gonna prime the world for the Antichrist, the one government ruler, one world government ruler that's coming I don't believe we will be here, the true church, when he appears. I don't. But all the preparation for his coming, we can see it before us. So what is God doing? If we don't hold things loosely, we risk the same thing to become spiritually blind with an overzealousness about what we think God's doing. God has had to show me many times. I thought I had, knew what was going on. He says, that's not what I'm doing. <laughs> wow, okay. Man, was that wrong. But when it 
could be something totally different than what we believe he's doing. We know right now he's preparing for the return of the Lord. And I truly believe the rapture of the church, the rapture of the church, the catching away of the church, is the next major event on the church calendar. I believe when that happens, um, there's a great book out right now by uh, Max Lucado and Jimmy Evans, was, uh, who's a real end time scholar, was interviewing Max Lucado. Mar- Marilyn and I were watching the interview on the way home yesterday, and um, I'm going to get the book because Max Lucado was not a pre tribulation pastor. All his time, he believed in ah, ah, millennialism. Ah, he was an ah, millennialism. A. Ah, millennial. He was an ah, millennialist. What is that? In a nutshell, they believe when Jesus ascended to heaven, that's when the millennial reign started. The thousand year millennial reign started then. And the thousand years are not literal, they're figurative. And Nero was the Antichrist. He persecuted the church. All these things they believe. And they believe we're living in the millennial reign now, not when Christ returns and begins the millennial reign in Revelation chapter 20. And when he comes back and returns, that's when, the, that's when we will all go to him in power. It's a really odd and crazy view of end times. But that's what they believe. Max Lucado grew up that, that way. He's, one of the, he's probably the most read author in the Christian world, Max Lucado. That's what he believed growing up. That's what he believed going to seminary until he began to listen to some other teachers and read the Bible, and it didn't make sense to him. Now he's totally flipped. He believes in a pre-tribulation rapture. And he wrote, just wrote a book about it, going back to the, the Garden of Eden all the, way to when, all the way to when Jesus returns. And he, God has given him tremendous insight. I don't agree with everything Max says, but he's a tremendous author, and he has great insight on things. So I'm going to buy this book and read it because that's the next major event, and that could happen very soon. But what am I saying that for? Maybe that's what's going to happen. Maybe the world's been prepared for that. Maybe it's 50 years away. I don't know. I tend to think that we're getting close to the end. But what is God doing? We need to stay humble and teachable that the Holy Spirit can continue to form and shape us to what God's doing on the earth. This was the Saul of Tarsus' problem. He thought he had God figured out and everything he was doing on the earth, and he began to fight against what God was doing. Christians have to be careful in this hour as the world is on fire of what God is really doing and stay close to the Lord, stay humble, teachable, walk with him day by day. Remember this, the devil is the God of that world and he's whipping the world into a frenzy right now. That's what he's doing. Remember, when we have our own views about what's going on, about what God's doing, what he's not doing, it's okay to have those views. There's nothing wrong with that, but hold them loosely. I'm going to lay something on you right now. Jesus wasn't a conservative. He wasn't a Republican. But he had many conservative views. Jesus wasn't a liberal. Jesus wasn't a Democrat. But he had many liberal views especially when it came to the marginalized in the society, the downtrodden. Yes, he did. And that's what eventually helped get him killed. When he looked at people who were not in the elite class and he elevated them and gave them purpose, gave them value, they could not understand that. The solitarsis put God inside of a spiritual box thinking that God was on his side, yet as he learned, he wasn't on Saul's side, and he didn't fit into Saul's box. Christians, we need to learn that as well in the days we're living in, to be humble and allow the Lord to direct us in what he's doing. I believe in the big picture that we're going to be called out of here. The rapture's coming, we're going to be called out of here like this. And I think when that happens, this world is going to see chaos like it's never seen before. When millions and millions of people, when graves are opened up and people resurrect, when that happens on the earth, it's going to cause the world to go into chaos. Because, you know, they're not going to say the Bible's true. They'll blame it on aliens. They'll blame it on something. But that is what I believe will probably prime the world for this new world leader to come up. And I don't believe we'll see him. But zeal for Jesus and his righteousness is a good thing. It is.
But our zeal in this climate we're living in at the moment needs to be mixed with prayer for guidance, along with humility and a teachability in our hearts so we too don't become spiritually blind as well to what God is doing in this hour or not doing in this hour. We all, have to, we all can have our views and our theology and that's good and that's normal. But our convictions and views, along with our theology, being fine. However, Saul of Tarsus had those things too. But he's showing us that we need to hold things loosely and allow God to shape our views according to where he's bringing the church in this hour. Amen. Overzealousness can cause blindness. We can't be blind in this hour. We need to see what God is doing. Lastly, I'll leave you with this. Number two. Jesus always sees a convert's potential. He always sees a convert's potential. Someone who, comes, who needs to come to Christ, what they will be if Jesus gets a hold of their heart. We're going to read Acts 9, the continuation of Acts 9 here. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and how all, and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. I'll leave you with this. Because of fear of Saul's reputation, Ananias was ready to write Saul off as a bad dude not to trust or be associated with. That was natural. I'm not faulting him for that. Unless he had an encounter with Jesus, and that's what happened. And that encounter changed Saul supernaturally for the glory and purposes of Jesus. And Jesus saw in Saul incredible knowledge in the law of Moses, in the Bible. He saw a passion for God in Saul. Jesus saw an intelligence in Saul. Jesus saw a zealousness which would be needed to fulfill the ministry Jesus was commissioning him to do. Because that was not for the faint of heart, what Saul had to go through. Paul, I mean, Paul had to go through. However, it was just directed in the wrong place. Jesus saw potential in Saul that would be a valuable asset to the kingdom of God if those qualities could be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus. That's not what Ananias saw. He saw a violent maniac who wanted to harm the church of Jesus Christ and rest him and take him back to Jerusalem. But it's amazing what many people see in some other people. What they see in you, what they see in me. What we see in people who don't know Jesus. We see things in them that are destructive and sinful and harmful. That's true. And they aggravate and anger us at times to no end. Well, what does Jesus see in those people that we see? Does he see an asset that the kingdom of God could use if they just submitted some of those things, those traits, those qualities to the kingdom of God? Yes, he does. If Jesus was able to get a hold of them like he did Saul of Tarsus, like he got a hold of Peter, like he got a hold of James, like he got a hold of John, Zacchaeus, the, name, the names are endless. What did Jesus see in all of you when he called you and saved you by his grace? What did he see in me? Believe me, I was a mess when he saved me. I didn't see this. He did. Paul, if you submit to me in my plan for your life, I will call you to be a shepherd of my people. If he spoke that to me in 1984, I would have said, okay, I'll check please, I'm out of here. Because I can't see, I couldn't see that then. But he saw it. He sees the same thing in all of you. When he saved you, and even now, he continues to see potential in you. 
what you can be used for for the kingdom of God. But many Christians shortchange Jesus. I can't do that. I can't do that. Yes, you can. We need laborers for the kingdom of God. This church needs laborers for the kingdom of God. He sees in people different qualities, different gifts that can be valuable assets to the kingdom of God. But we're too afraid, we're too sheepish, we're too timid to step out and walk in the plans of God, and we miss Jesus. Some of us would be up here with Jesus instead of here if we just said, Lord, use me. No, I got two, two. I, I, got, I, I play softball on Tuesday nights, and I do this, and I do that. <laughs> Great. Your award ceremony is going to be greatly disappointing to you. Now I'm preaching. I'm raising a fire in the church of God. We need to understand there are good works laid out for all of us to walk in. But many Christians don't walk in them. Well, I try to pray. I try. No! Yes, you can do all that. There is a plan and a purpose for every single Christian. I don't care how old you are or young you are. And you need to pray and say, Lord, use me. What is your specific plan for me to walk in? Because I don't want to miss you. I want a connection with you. I want to have joy and peace that I'm doing something for the kingdom of God. And I want to be proud at that award ceremony that, Lord, I didn't disappoint you. I know I'll still suffer loss for the things I didn't do, but I want to have gain for what you have for me. And I want you to have that same thing. Seriously, don't discount yourself on what the plans and purposes of God are for you. You are not disqualified. Jesus still sees what we can become for his plans and purposes because we are his workmanship. You know what the New Living Translation says that? It says we are his masterpieces. We are his masterpieces that he's shaping and molding and creating into something beautiful. Like an artist chiseling away at a piece of ice to make a beautiful swan. That's what God is doing with us. To use us for his purposes. The Apostle Paul wrote half of our New Testament guided by the Holy Spirit. Which is such spiritual food for the church, for our souls and a roadmap for Christian living, which produces in us power, joy, peace, and victory. Because this man was willing to walk in the purposes that God had for him and to submit to Jesus. And he paid dearly for it, if you know about his ministry. No, he didn't buy a house in Damascus and just kick back and did his thing. Because that's not why Jesus saved him. Moses, and I said this before, as you know the story of Moses, they were killing all the Hebrew boys back in Egypt at that time. And Moses was a little Hebrew boy, and his mother put him in the little basket at the edge of the Nile River. Said, I don't know how I'm going to save him, but at least I can get him out of the way until I figure things out. Why was Moses saved and so many little Hebrew boys were killed? Because Moses was saved for a purpose. And we know that purpose. It was to rise up and be the deliverer of the Jewish people to take them out of that same country that wanted to kill him. He was saved for a purpose. Every one of us was saved for a purpose. But when we start to ask the Lord to use me, guide me, everyone has something inside of you that says, I want to do that. I want to do that. There's something in you that's unique that says, I'd like to do that for Jesus. Because God planted it in you. Whether it's a teacher whether it's a missionary, whether it's an evangelist, whether it's just vacuuming the carpet, whatever it is, God's called you to do something. And you become a member of this church, you have to be active. You have to be active to be a member here because God's called you to do something because I want you to experience Jesus in the best way possible. That's my heart as a shepherd. So anyways, let's learn from Saul of Tarsus today who became virtually the greatest apostle that ever lived on the earth, and was so grateful that he submitted to the plans and purposes of God, and he let Jesus reshape and mold his life. And we will meet him one day when we go to eternity with all the other saints. Amen to that? All right. Lord, I thank you so much for this conversion story, this radical conversion of Saul of Tarsus. How Jesus, you used him as your instrument to really, really start the church in a pagan world. 
And Lord, we thank you and praise you for his commitment. We thank you for Paul's zeal. We thank you how he endured under suffering. We thank you that you gave him incredible grace and insight on how he walked with you. And he died faithfully under, under Nero's execution of we believe was beheading. But he did that because he knew he was graduating at that very moment into glory. So Lord, I pray for your people today that they would take that sense of what God has called them to do, the gifts he's put in them, but also the passion inside of their own soul that is God born to do something for Christ and to throw away the sheepishness, sheepishness that I can't do that. Yes, they can. Saul could not do what Jesus called him to do, but he did it in the power of God with the call of God. So I pray that blessing, whether it's something small, something big, whatever you called your people to do, I pray that you would speak to them, God, but also help us, Lord, to be teachable and humble in the days we live in, because we believe we know what you're doing, but we don't know timelines. We don't have understanding. When we see the world on fire, we see evil at every, every count. When we look on the news, we look out. We, don't, we know, Lord, this world is coming to a climax. And the end is coming before the glorious return of Jesus. That gives us peace. That gives us joy. That gives us security. Knowing that we have a grasp on truth that Jesus is coming again. And that should give us such, such, such a strong foundation to stand on. So bless your people with peace in the hour we live in. We love you so much, Lord. Thank you for saving us by your grace. Thank you for the mercy you show us. You are a good, good father. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.